What's going on, Champagne Gang? Fierce fam, confidants. <laughs> Welcome to another Wellness Waves Wednesdays. Yeah. Where we pause from the clinking chaos of champagne secrets to focus on our mental health. And if anyone has been following us with the Wellness Waves Wednesdays, you know we have been in a series called Escaping the Heartbreak Hotel. Baby, because you know heartbreak can be treacherous on the soul and I want to make sure you have the tools in order to escape and if you have been missing it baby we have been having a time trying to get this mental health under control we've discussed the loneliness lounge hate chambers and anger in self-loathing chambers intertwined with the insecurity suites the depression suites and today we are discussing the adjoining room to the depression suites, which is the anxiety boudoir. Yeah. And we have a special secret room that we will discuss at the end. So stay tuned because baby, today we received the final tools for escaping the heartbreak hotel. Because next week we are starting a new series and that series is entitled Managing Your Ship. And it will be all things relationships, friendships, courtships, family ships, companionships, and even workships. We need to learn some coping skills for when the seas start raging so we can keep our ships afloat and we don't shipwreck. So stay tuned. But before we start with the anxiety boudoir, let's quickly recap the depression suites. So check out these clips from the last Wellness Waves Wednesdays and we'll be right back so over the last few weeks right we've dealt with a few different rooms in the heartbreak hotel and if you're interested in watching them you can watch them individually or you can watch the live that i did with them all together but we discussed the suffocating grasp and solitude of the loneliness lounge we discussed the raging storms of the anger inn and the hate chambers. We also discussed the hidden anxieties of the self-loathing chambers and insecurity ends. This week we're focusing on the waves of sorrow in the depression suite and anxiety boudoir. Mm -hmm. So this week is all about depression. <laughs> so let's set the stage, right? Let me describe the Heartbreak Hotel for you. So I just want you to close your eyes and imagine with me. One of the things you'll learn if you're new over here is everything that we do over here has to do with the imagination. Even when we go into the chalet, when we go into the Hennessy zone, are we drinking Hennessy for real? No, I'm not an alcoholic like that. <laughs> are we really drinking that much champagne? No, but I want to give you the opportunity to feel like you're in another place, to escape where you are, and to feel the peace, the tranquility, and the zen of the aura that we're trying to create, right? So close your eyes with me. Imagine this architectural masterpiece that looks like it pops straight out of a dream. The facade, it's absolutely stunning. It's glistening under the sun with those intricate details and shimmering glass windows that seem to reflect the sky. So imagine you're walking through this grand archway into an entrance that's adorned with this large, gorgeous, glistening chandelier that's as radiant as a jewel and it's casting an inviting glow. The gardens are next level gorgeous with vibrant, fragrant flowers, winding paths and fountains that dance to the melodies of the wind. It's the kind of place that fills you with hope and excitement just by looking at it, right? Now, once you're inside of this masterpiece, you're greeted by a vast marble lobby decorated with classical artwork and elegant furnishings. The air is filled with the scent of fresh flowers, lavender and vanilla, and there's a soft, soothing music that's playing in the background. The staff, <laughs> impeccably dressed, they're offering warm smiles, promising to make your stay unforgettable. The rooms are pure luxury. They're plush with oversized beds that have high thread counts. Designer decor everywhere. Floor to ceiling windows offering panoramic views of paradise that feels almost unreal. But here's the kicker. As soon as you settle in and that door closes behind you, the truth hits. The Heartbreak Hotel for all its glamour and glitz is just a facade. 
The luxury it promises, empty and cold, like a mirage in the desert. The reality really sets in. This place isn't just a catchy name for Elvis fans. It's a trap, one that you've placed yourself in and one that you've got to find your way out of. The Heartbreak Hotel stands as a metaphor for the traps we fall into when we let our emotions run the show without the benefit of our intellect. It's a reminder that without discernment, even the most beautiful facades can hide profound inner struggles. So there's three things that can cause you to be a guest at the Heartbreak Hotel, right? The first is the thought trap. Baby, them thoughts can take you on a roller coaster ride, can't they? <laughs> We've all had those moments when we can't stop replaying the past, just over and over and over, wondering what we could have done differently, beating ourselves up because of past mistakes, some mistakes that weren't even our fault, just thoughts upon thoughts upon thoughts. And by the time our thoughts stop thoughting, you look up and you find yourself trapped. Anybody been there? Mm -hmm. Next is the emotional vortex. Ooh, he's so emotional, so emotional, so emotionally sensitive that the wind blowing the wrong way can set our emotions in a whirlwind that will have us looking for the Wicked Witch of the West once we finally settle down. Just emotional. One minute we're crying and the next minute we're smiling. We don't know what to feel or how to control what we feel because we've never even sat down to determine why we feel what we feel. Mm -hmm. And then finally, we have the circumstantial quicksand because sometimes it's the external circumstances of our lives that lead us into the Heartbreak Hotel. So generally, if a person is in the self-loathing chambers and insecurity suites, baby, they also have keys to the depression suite and anxiety boudoir. They do. It's those self-imposed hurts that we internalize and feel powerless to express or face that leave us feeling down and fearful. We're so fearful. We're fearful that someone will break our heart. We're fearful of being hurt, fearful of being used, of being taken advantage of. So we create these pretend electrocuted fences with barbed wire guarded by three pit bulls to keep people out. But do you not know that the worst place you can ever find yourself in is in isolation? Mm -hmm. Because that's where the enemy plays with you at the most. The enemy can really play with your mind in isolation. Nobody loves me. Nobody wants me. Nobody cares about me. You ever realize you never really have these thoughts when you're surrounded by the right people? Unless they are individuals who you deem responsible for part of your isolation. But when you're surrounded by individuals who care about you and are concerned about your well-being, you don't wrestle with these type of thoughts. You don't. And here's the thing, right? The problem isn't that you don't trust others. Mm -mm. The problem is that you don't trust yourself. You don't trust yourself enough to make a decision regarding the others that you let in your life that will benefit you. You don't. You don't trust yourself enough to choose the others to have in your life because you tried it in the past and failed. Imagine this, right? Imagine a crossroads in life where the path to the depression sweep begins. And it's often marked by a profound sorrow, like an aching loss or unrelenting waves of sadness. So as you traverse this path, right, the air begins to change. It becomes heavy with the weight of unresolved emotions. So upon entering the depression suite, you're enveloped with hues of blue. The room feels like a sanctuary of sorrow, where the air hangs heavy with the weight of unresolved emotions, each breath a struggle beneath the suffocating emptiness, where every corner echoes with whispers of regret. Each breath becomes a struggle beneath the suffocating shroud of sadness, reminding you of the depths of your own emotions. And we might not make it to anxiety on this week because we need to really deal with depression. Mm -hmm. We need to de deal with depression because I'm tired of seeing it. I'm tired of seeing it because I know what it felt because I dealt with it myself. You start to feel like you're trapped in a room with no windows. And if there are windows, you feel like you want to cover them up. You feel numb and empty and sometimes you feel nothing at all. It can grasp you so hard that sometimes you just want to give up. Sometimes it's not that you want to end it yourself, but you feel like if you just was not, <laughs> as the Bible says, then it really wouldn't matter because you're sick and you're tired. And at this point, you're sick and tired of being sick and tired. Depression makes you angry. Not only does it make you angry, but it makes you angry that you're angry. And it makes you angry that you're happy. 
and it makes you angry that you're sad. Depression comes from the Latin word deprimir, which means to press down. So you have all of this weight on top of you. You have weight on top of weight on top of weight that's constantly being added on top of weight. And because we don't take the time to troubleshoot one, by the time we get to the fifth, we're out of it because we're constantly going through life with baggage that we never deal with. Family baggage, friend baggage, relationship baggage, work baggage, even children baggage. We take on so much, so much trauma that we never take the time out to unpackage. And then we internalize it, we absorb it, and we make it a part of us. Bills are not a part of you. They are an external entity affecting you, but we absorb it. We make it a part of our being. Instead of asking God to show us an available move to see our way out or through that difficult situation, then we give up. And what happens? Here it comes, another pile of stuff we have to wade through. And that's what we do. We just wade through it and it all starts mixing together. So much so that you can no longer remember which emotion belongs to which situation anymore. So now everybody gotta pay for your imbalance. You see, it's all connected. How you feel about yourself will trigger how you project how you want others to feel about you. If you're always depressed, everyone is going to see you as the depressed chick or the depressed guy. If you're always negative, that's how you'll be viewed because that's what you are telling other people is at your core. Then you'll start drawing to you those who pity you or those who are as depressed as you because you attract what you put out. And some stuff we didn't attract, we willingly walked into because we thought it was what we wanted until we learned it was to detour us from what we needed. Ooh, if we gonna talk about it, let's talk. Scoot up. And now we're so pressed down, the premier, that we're trying to lift up to catch a breath, but it feels like we are now carrying the weight of the world on our shoulders. When in actuality, the weight is just your own. And do you know why it's your own? Because you chose to pick it up. Now let's put all the pretense to the side and get real for a second because I'm one who's transparent with a purpose. So I'm about to release some of my business with hopes that it'll help you with yours, right? So recently, I went through depression. I did, I did. I went through depression so bad that I didn't know if I was gonna see my way through. I mean, I went to a dark place. I couldn't eat, I couldn't think. And the bigger problem was I didn't want to. I was in that place of, I didn't want to take my own life, but if I just was not, it would not have mattered. Yeah, that was me that I was talking about. See, I talked to you about where I've been so you'll understand that it's not just talk. Baby, I walk this. <laughs> and I am walking this. And as many stories as I have covered of women taking their lives or having such low self-esteem that they subject themselves to abuse or even the men who seem to place all of their value in what a woman says about them that they try to prove who they are, it breaks my heart. Bottle boys, I need my fellas to scoot up for a second. Let me encourage you, because every time you get out the shower or go to the bathroom, what's swinging between your legs lets you know who you are. If my little pony can't accept who you are, then throw that fish back in the net and try again. Stop limiting your worth to what these gold digging zacatas have to say. Don't they live only four to six weeks above the ground anyway? Y'all better start sending these pocket watching broads back to the rivers and the falls that they used to. Stop trying to level up people who never showed you they were on your level to begin with. Stop. <clears throat> but now back to my story. <laughs> About two years ago, I started losing everything. I did. I had bought a house from a company I worked for and the company closed due to the bosses not getting along. One boss quit and the other said they were going to keep the company going and one day we woke up on payday without checks and no answer from the boss. So because I had just purchased my house and purchased it from them, might, might I add, I tried to do a modification on my house and it was approved but in the middle of it my loan was sold to another company. Mm -hmm. You can imagine. So. I began speaking with them and requesting that they reset the start date of the modification because they received the terms like two months late, which means I didn't have them. So I fought with them for like three years over this modification and for my house. 
a house that I actually put money into. So eventually I had to turn my 13 into a seven because the mortgage company was fighting me so hard. And they were fighting me during the pandemic when they were supposed to be helping to keep people in their houses. So during the pandemic, my modification was finally approved, right? And the trial modification began. So because it was the pandemic, of course, none of the mailmen were running. Post office was closed. Every, everything was closed, right? So all of my payments were making it to the bank instead of making it the same month. By the end of the month, it was making it like the first or the second of the next month. So the mortgage company actually dropped my modification. They went to the court, told the court that I wasn't fulfilling my obligation. Now, mind you, it wasn't that they didn't get the money. They just got the money a few days late. So they canceled my bankruptcy and I had to refile the bankruptcy during the pandemic. So the job I was working, right? I was training the staff. I had a full caseload. I was the office admin. I had run of the office. So I started to complain because I actually had two different jobs. I was working two different positions. I was an office administrator and I had a full office team that I had to manage, but I was also a case manager, full case manager. So I had a full caseload that I had to manage. So I started to complain to them to let them know like, hey, y'all got me doing two positions for one pay. But then on top of that, I noticed that people were starting to get hired making the same amount of money as me or more than me, but didn't have the same expectations as me. And a lot of them were hired underneath me. So because I'm a strategist, right, and a documentation developer and a trainer, and I'm the type of person that if I'm on your team and I'm a part of your company, then every gift that I have on the inside of me, it belongs to that company. And I'm going to do everything that I can to help uplift and build and push the company to the next level because it's just in me to do it. So um, I was a documentation developer and a trainer and I trained the staff and I hosted orientations and I did um, monthly meetings and team building exercises with the team. Right. I had to troubleshoot billing and these staff members we're not talking about staff members who had a complete understanding of what it means to work in something that's considered trying to be corporate America. These are individuals who did not even understand basic office software. So not only did I have to train them to their tasks, I also had to train them on how to use Word, how to use Excel, how to email structure, how to format a letter. I had to manage their cases. So. All of a sudden, because I was complaining, I started to get write-ups. Write-ups that were just being made up because my staff was confused as to where the write-ups were coming from. I developed audits to help them keep their paperwork intact and to keep them straight. But then I started getting wrote up in areas that I didn't even handle. Because I was the office manager or the office administrator, I was told it was still my responsibility. So if anything went wrong, it fell on me, even though this was not an area I ever handled, right? So press pause. I need y'all to remember this. When God tells you to walk away from a person, place, or thing, it's best to do it when he tells you to. Number two, because you don't know what he's protecting you from. But number one, because when you don't, he will sometimes allow something so detrimental to happen to make you walk away and never look back. Think about it. Think about some of your relationships and friendships. Think about some of those attachments that you knew. You kept hearing that voice saying, walk away, walk away, walk away. This ain't good for you. But you listened to your heart, which kept telling you, run to it, run to it, run to it. And by the time it was all said and done, your heart was broken. Your mind was unstable and you was ready to go postal and tear everything up. So now at this time, I didn't know what depression was, right? Because I'm a fighter and I always bounce back. Same day, I received a call from a former boss saying that he had a friend who needed a property manager. So now that's something that I love to do because it gives me the opportunity to connect with people. I did it for five years, right? I was my tenant's aunt. I was their mom. I was their sister. I was their friend. I was their counselor. I was their prayer warrior. <laughs> All of it, right? So I was like, yes, God, thank you. This is it. And y'all know how we do, right? When the enemy closes one door, another one opens, right? 
those are the lines we use, right? <laughs> so they hired me from one conversation. Now this job, I was a property manager at a property management company. So they had all of these different departments as to where when I did it before, it was just me. So everything that they did in different departments, I handled by myself. So I started in maintenance. The girl who got me hired thought that I was gonna be hired underneath her. But instead I was hired as her equal, which meant I got my own staff. Baby, she was hotter than fish grease. <laughs> you could have roasted a whole pig on her skin, baby, red hot. Now, the kicker is when I started at this company, I was the only black face there. So here comes this black girl with standards telling us how to work smarter and not harder and standing up for people and telling pe telling us what she's not going to allow us to do to other people, right? Because you got to understand, even though I was the only black face in the company, a lot of the houses they managed had faces in them that looked like me. Mm -hmm. So here's where the problem comes in with me, right? I don't know how to shut up. <laughs> I don't. I don't know how to sit back and watch people being done wrong in my presence and not say anything. Baby, I'm a shepherd for the underdog. I am. It's not in my DNA to sit back and watch someone being mistreated and not say something. It was the same with my other job. No, you're not putting more work on my team when they already have enough. No, make the people who are sitting around and doing nothing do their own work. There's a difference between delegating work and distributing your work. There is a difference. So we would clash because she would start sabotaging my work. I started to see red flags again and my spidey senses start going off because I'm like, I'm reporting this stuff and they aren't doing anything. So finally it came to a head and I almost wrung that heifer like a wet tile. Do you hear me? Because two things you're not gonna play with. You're not gonna play with my name and you're not gonna play with my character, just don't. So they moved me to rent collection, right? They didn't do anything to her. So they moved me to rent collection and customer service. Now mind you, I train customer service. <laughs> so me being on the phone is nothing for me, but I'm like, okay, y'all playing. So now everybody calling, wanting to speak to me, tenants, owners, everyone, because I build rapport. I had the largest rent collection group because I'm really helping these tenants to get current and not running to eviction court because they fell behind. So now we have another problem because now people aren't paying their rent because work orders aren't being fulfilled. So I'm talking to the tenants and to maintenance. She deleting work orders and I'm telling them, look, I'm not making someone pay rent with two feet of raw sewage in their basement. I'm not. Yes, elderly people in a building with, with a stairwell and no lights is an emergency and you're going to make a one. I was going to the houses and then contacting the owners to tell them, I think your tenant's rent should go down from $12.50 to $8.50 until these items are fixed. Child, I had tenants with no doorknobs, including their front and back doors and nowhere in the house. And she was paying $2,400 for rent because she was renting the upstairs and the downstairs. And mind you, the upstairs had no heat in the middle of the winter. And they were telling her she was lying. You thought I was gonna sit back and allow y'all to continue to charge this girl for rent and not say nothing, just collect money. That's not how I operate. It's not my MO. So of course, one day, I get called into the office after about six months of working there. And I'm told they are letting me go because they feel I am too much of a people person and I need a job that offers more responsibility. <laughs> Say what now? <laughs> I need a job that offers more responsibility when you have workers that have too much responsibility and you could just offload responsibility and maybe more would get done. Now mind you, at this point, my chapter seven has gone through. So I have surrendered my house I just got a new car because I surrendered my old car. I just moved into a house, mind you, a house that my job helped me get <laughs> because they knew I was losing my house through a chapter seven. So I just got the house a month prior. So I'm sitting here like, I know you near the freaking line. To me, baby, I went dark. I did. I lost weight because it looked like everywhere I turned was defeat after defeat upon defeat on top of defeat i felt like why the good get hit the worst you know what i mean why does it seem like it's always harder when you're trying to do right than it is when you're trying to do wrong why am i punished for caring so much 
for caring about the well-being of others. Because if I would have just shut up and went with the flow and let those people be done any kind of way, I would still have a job. Y'all, I would just cry and cry and cry because all I wanted to do was help people. How could someone as smart, as gifted, as talented as me not be able to hold income without sacrificing my morals? Some of us know how to get money, but we choose not to sacrifice our conscience and our moral aptitude to do it. That's the problem. So one day, I received a call about an opportunity to start my business, right? Because I'm a personal vision coach and a business strategist. I'm all about helping individuals and businesses to create a roadmap for their lives and their businesses and an action plan to bring those dreams to life. So I didn't have a counselor or insurance or a therapist. All I had was myself. And what I want you to know is you are the key to escaping the trap. See, I made a conscious decision within myself that enough was enough. And I was sick and tired of being sick and tired of being sick and tired. And there was a world that I needed to help and people I needed to snatch out of the grasp of the enemy's hands and individuals I needed to teach how to smile again because I always found it was always easier to help pull others out than to pull myself out. But that was because I spent my time focusing on others until I had almost lost myself. Let's talk about it. See, sometimes we gotta be honest and be real and let ourselves know that a lot of the reason why we are in the place that we are in is because we placed ourselves there by the decisions that we made and the doors that we chose to walk through. The problem with so many of us is we are so lost. We have lost ourselves in the identities of others. Yes, you are a wife, but you are also you. Yes, you are a husband, but you are also you. Yes, you are a mom and those children need to be provided for, but so do you. And if you don't take care of you, you will be no good for them. So I had to say within myself, and if I have any confidence from the church, we would say I had to encourage myself. I had to find something that was greater than me to help pull me from where I was. There's not going to be anyone around all the time to pat you on the back. There's not always going to be someone there to wipe your eyes. There won't always be someone there to tell you you got what it takes and you can make it. So you're going to have to learn how to pull from on the inside until it begins to manifest on the outside. If you're a Christian, you better pull on every scripture that you know. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil for thou art with me. Thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. You better pull on it. The Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? The Lord is the strength of my life. Of whom shall I be afraid? When the wicked, even my enemies and my foes came upon me to eat up my flesh, they stumbled and fell. Though an host should encamp against me, my heart shall not fear. Pull on what you know. For in the time of trouble, he shall hide me in his pavilion. In the secret of his tabernacle shall he hide me. He shall set me upon a rock. And now shall my head be lifted up above mine enemies round about me. Depression isn't something you can think your way out of. You have to speak your way out of it. Maybe you don't know scripture. So let me tell you one thing that worked for me. So one day I was sitting back and I heard this song. And this song was You Got It by Vito. Mind you, I'd heard this song before. It wasn't my first time. But this time when I listened to this song, it did something different for me. I actually felt something. It was like this song began speaking to me. And I would hear this song, you got it, you got it. And I would just cry and cry. So what I did was I would start playing this song when I got in the shower. I don't know about y'all, but for some reason I find all of my encouragement in the shower. Whenever I step into the shower, it feels like that's when God speaks to me the most. <laughs> So I started listening to this song in the shower. And the more I would listen to this song, the more I would cry. Listening to him tell me I got it, I got it. Then one day, while I was listening to the song, it was like the song started speaking to me. So not only did the song start speaking to me, but it was almost as if I could hear myself speaking to me through the song. So now the song took on a different meaning. So instead of someone else telling me I got it, I began to tell myself I got it. Not only did I begin to tell myself I got it, 
But when it got to certain sections of the song, instead of relaying the song to a man or a woman like the song does, I changed the words and used depression. Yeah, I did. I changed the words and start saying F depression. And I would say it over and over again every time I took a shower a day, if I took a shower in the afternoon, if I took a shower in the night, baby, this song was playing nonstop. I know my kids got tired of it. I know, but I was on a mission for myself because again, I didn't have nobody else who understood my pain. So one day while I was singing it, instead of tears, I felt empowered. Baby, I was in that shower dancing and pointing my finger and F depression and F that nigga. What happened was I used those words to pull on something on the inside of me that was greater than myself because the song called for me to pull on my purpose and start focusing on myself again. It's time to boss up. Fix your credit, girl, get at it, get your bag up, hit the gym and get back fine. Focus on me, unlock potential that you didn't know you had in you. Fuck depression, girl. Listen, sweetie, this song became my personal anthem. Now that I found something that had given me a sense of my power back, I had to figure out a way to hold on to it when I wasn't in the shower. <laughs> so that's when I found positive affirmations. And I started speaking positively to myself and telling me you are worth it. You can make it. You are beautiful. You got this. Because you see, there was a time in my life where I really didn't think I was that pretty. I didn't. I didn't think I was ugly, but I didn't think I was pretty. Like I've never been a vain chick where I spent so much time focusing on my looks. Like if I was standing next to someone who I thought was prettier than me, I wasn't insecure to the pack to the point where I would cower back. But it's just for me, I never felt I was really that pretty, right? So I started affirming myself. I started looking myself in the mirror and telling myself that I'm beautiful. Because see, what you don't understand is that when a person is struggling with their own securities, it doesn't matter how many times you tell them they're beautiful. Until they see it within themselves, they'll never believe it. So I had to start believing that I was beautiful. So I started using my positive affirmations. Not only that, I started using my visualization techniques. Why do you think that I have and I have developed the night secrets for you guys with affirmations? Because that's what I use to help me sleep. I didn't develop a lot of this stuff because I'm just creative and know how. A lot of this stuff was developed because it was tools for me. And now I'm taking those tools and letting them be tools for you. So you don't have to go through the hardship and the heartache and they're trying to figure it out that I had to do. All you gotta do is push play on the video, honey. <laughs> and start visualizing your way to freedom. Broaden your imagination. Start to dream again. Start to envision again. Start to picture the you that you want to be. Because until you get into your mind the you that you want to be, it'll never manifest. Because every manifestation started first as a vision. What is your vision? What is your vision for yourself? Because until you can envision yourself outside of depression, you'll never be able to step outside of depression. And it's time for all of us to begin to walk into our freedom. So at some point, we're going to have to take a step back and start focusing on us, focusing on more than just our exterior. Start focusing on what really matters, our interior. Start focusing on our mental health. We have fun with the clinking chaos, don't get me wrong, but the clinking chaos is no good for us if our life is chaotic. So depression doesn't have to have a hold on you. You can break free, but it's going to take a choice from you. Ooh, we wasn't that good. <laughs> Y'all ready to escape depression yet? Well, right next to depression is the anxiety boudoir. Let's get ready to get into it because anxiety is what happens when you've spent too much time in the dark. Yeah, because depression will lead you into some dark places in your mind, in your spirit, and in your emotions. It's that crippling fear that you have once you feel like you've lost emotional and mental control. You're afraid to live, you're afraid to die, you're afraid of what tomorrow will bring, and you're afraid of what the past has brought. It sits on your chest 
like a boulder and makes it hard for you to breathe. If you've ever had an anxiety attack, you know exactly what I'm talking about because it makes you feel like you're in the midst of a heart attack because you're overtaken with this crippling fear, this crippling worry that you can't seem to shake. So let's talk about this boudoir. It's a chamber born from the restless whirlwind of worry and unease. Envision it as an ethereal space painted with vibrant but erratic hues, where the walls resonate with the phrenic dance of anxious thoughts and every corner swirls with the anticipation of the unknown. It's like walking into a dark room of mirrors and you're afraid of what they will reflect. You're full of self-doubt. It's like being stuck in a room where the walls are constantly closing in. Every sound, every shadow feels amplified, making your heart race like you're constantly on edge. You know that feeling when you miss a step on the stairs and your heart skips a beat? Yeah, imagine feeling that way all day, every day. Anxiety can make your mind a whirlwind of what ifs and worst case scenarios. It's like being at a party where everyone is talking, but you can't hear a single word, just noise. You try to focus, but your thoughts are scattered, bouncing around like pinballs in a pinball machine. The minute you hone in on one thought, you're being bounced right to the next. It's more than just a feeling of nervousness before a big event. It's waking up in the middle of the night with your heart pounding for no reason at all. It's a constant feeling of dread like something bad is about to happen, but you don't know what or when. Have you ever felt like that? Have you ever felt that sudden rush of adrenaline when you're scared or stressed? That's anxiety working its magic. Picture this. So you're chilling, minding your own business. Then bam, your body thinks you're in danger, even if it's not. It's like your brain hits the panic button out of nowhere. When anxiety kicks in, your brain sends signals to your body to prepare for a fight or flight situation. Your heart starts pounding, racing as if you're just sprinted up a flight of stairs. It's getting ready to pump blood to your muscles in case you need to make a quick getaway. Your breathing changes too. You might start taking quick shallow breaths which make you feel lightheaded or dizzy. It's your body trying to get more oxygen in, but it can make you feel even more on edge. Ever notice your muscles getting tense? Yeah, that's another part of it. Your body is gearing up, making sure you're ready to react. But when there's no actual danger, all of that tension just leaves you feeling stiff and sore. But then, on top of all of that, there's the sweating. Your palms get clammy. You might even feel a little hot. It's like your body's way of cooling down because it thinks you're about to go through something intense. Your stomach can even act up. Nausea, butterflies, or even the need to run to the bathroom can all be anxiety's doing. It's like your digestive system gets thrown off balance because your body is focusing on survival mode. And let's not forget the mind. Your thoughts start racing, jumping from one worry to the next. It's hard to focus on anything else when your brain is caught in a loop of what ifs. But here's the thing. Our bodies are just trying to protect us even if it doesn't always make sense. It's like having an over-enthusiastic guard dog that barks at every little noise. Sometimes we need to remind ourselves to just take a deep breath, tell our bodies it's okay, and calm down that guard dog. But all of these realms of emotion are interconnected, intertwined by the threads of vulnerability and human complexity. The depression suite, anxiety boudoir, self-loathing chambers, and insecurity suites form an intricate nexus where emotions collide and intertwine. Imagine the traveler standing at the convergence of these emotional crossroads. The echoes of self-doubt and insecurity resonating with the melancholy of depression and the frenzied cadence of anxiety. The energies from each room reverberate, creating an emotional symphony that 
amplifies the depths of despair. There's no way to be in one and not seemingly find yourself in another. People who struggle with self-loathing find themselves dealing with depression and the fear of rejection triggers their anxiety. Get it? In order to escape, you have to get your mind, your body, and your emotions in one accord. Watch this. If my mind is telling me that I need to change my eating habits, it's because the body has sent a signal to the mind that something is off, and the mind has identified that it could be your eating habits, and it's signaling you through thought that you need to do something to fix it. And when you don't, your body starts reacting to the unhealthy habits, and it goes into fight or flight and triggers your anxiety defense, which is your body trying to fight back even if it doesn't know what it is fighting. Get it? So in order to escape, you have to get your mind, body, and emotions to operate as one. Easier said than done, right? Well, that's where mind over matter comes in at. Uh -huh. Because you need to strengthen your mind so it can only focus on what matters. And what it focuses on, you either need to change or fix. But that also means that you need to learn to train your mind to only focus on what matters because remember what you feed the most will rain the most. If you're focused on I'm not worthy, your mind will reinforce what you are focused on. But if you begin training your mind that nothing is impossible for you, then your mind will begin to reciprocate those thoughts. That's why you need to be grounded. We need to be grounded. That's why I have my night secrets on the channel to help you focus on positivity before you go to sleep so you can readjust your subconscious when you are asleep. Even having the calm music in the background of my videos, it's all a ploy to induce relaxation and peace instead of chaos. It's to bring your mind and emotions to a state of calm. That's why I don't do a lot of yelling in my videos because that triggers excitement and excitement triggers anxiety. Get it? You've had enough of that through the day. Now it's the time to detox from that and find a place of peace and tranquility. When was the last time you were actually at a state of peace? When I say state, that means a mindset. When was the last time your mind was at peace? The night secret videos were created and they have breathing exercises in them because we take for granted the power of a simple breath. You'd be amazed at what taking the time to step back and just take some deep focused breaths can do for the body and the mind. The clarity it can bring because it tells the body we are okay, we are safe, there is no threat here and you can think clearly and process information better because you are in control. But there is one way and one way only to escape the Heartbreak Hotel. You see, because all of the tools that I've given you are coping skills, tools to help you deal with the feeling. But we don't just want to deal with the feeling, we want to escape. So let me show you how to turn the keys in and escape this emotional hell that you have been trapped in for so long. Because there's a secret pathway within the Heartbreak Hotel and not many people know about it. Within the Heartbreak Hotel is a clandestine journey, a passage that reveals itself only to those ready for profound transformation. It's a destination reached not by chance, but by the deliberate pursuit of self-discovery and growth. The route here isn't marked by opulent signs or grandeur. It's concealed within the subtle whispers of self-awareness, a path that gradually reveals itself as one's readiness for genuine transformation unfolds. There's an old saying, right, that I learned when I was young. When the student is ready, the teacher will show up. It's hard to be taught when you're not ready to learn. Some people have been trapped so long they've become comfortable, comfortable with the anger, comfortable with self-loathing, with depression, with anxiety, that even thinking about living without it brings another sense of fear and turmoil. It's like the statement some people aren't afraid of failure, they're afraid of success because success represents the unknown but failure represents familiarity it's easier for me to sit in what i'm familiar with than to take a chance and step out into the unknown it's just like with this channel right i was so afraid in the beginning to start because will i be accepted 
Will I be enough? Will they understand my heart, my passion, my dream, my true desire? Will I draw people to me? Will I be heard? I was afraid of something that hadn't even happened yet to give me a sense of fear. And that's why fear is false evidence appearing real. Because what evidence did I have to support my fear? Past experiences? There's only one thing you can do with the past. Learn from it, not rehearse, relive and regurgitate it. A lot of times it's the stories we tell ourselves that ends us up trapped in the heartbreak hotel. But this den remains elusive to many. It's often obscured by the allure of comfort found in other chambers. It's a space reserved for those who have traversed through the emotional labyrinth, acknowledging the need for a deeper introspection. The den doesn't call out loudly, it whispers, inviting those who seek true liberation beyond the facade of luxury. And so, when a traveler reaches a critical juncture, a moment of profound realization or a deep yearning for authenticity and change, that's when the hidden pathway to the accountability den emerges. It's the juncture where one confronts the necessity for personal responsibility and embraces the discomfort of self-accountability. Because this den is all about you, not the past, not the future. This den is about taking a look at the man in the mirror or woman. When you are ready to face yourself, you will find the path to the accountability den. See, we are so busy always pointing the fingers at others. They did, she did, he did. When do you step back and say, this was my fault? At some point, you will have to look at your outcome and you will have to say that a lot of this is the aftermath of my choices. I spent more than I saved. I didn't respect money and that's how I lost it. I chose my partner based on looks, not based on the ability to build a thriving future together. I didn't take the time to get to know who I was looking at. I chose based on emotions without the benefit of intellect. I gave my heart a job it was never meant to have. I'm letting my heart make decisions for me and I'm forcing my mind to go along with it and my body to follow. I'm struggling as a single mother because I should have been more selective with who I chose to procreate with. I struggle with my self-image because I place value on myself based on what others stated was valuable. And because I didn't fit the status quo, I started to debase my worth. I was hurt as a child and I didn't know how to express it so I absorbed it and internalized it. I held on to the guilt as if subconsciously I thought it was my fault. I have a serious problem with men because my father wasn't there or my father was abusive. My mother was abusive. My mother didn't love me. And that's why I can't have meaningful relationships with men or women because they represent what hurt me. I was essayed and became bitter and angry because I didn't know how to process what happened or why it happened. I take accountability for my actions and reactions based on past trauma. And I choose to now release every hurt, every pain, every ounce of brokenness, rejection, fury, rage, every anger. I release the individuals who hurt me, betrayed me, left me feeling broken because they no longer have a stronghold on me. I choose to step into my freedom. See, this is about you. This is about you being willing to let go of what doesn't benefit you for your future. Until you let go, you can never move forward. It's like trying to mount up with wings of an eagle and fly. But you've got baggages and baggages of weight strapped to your shoulders. And the more you try to take a leap to soar into the air, you're being pulled back to the ground by an unseen force because you're not willing to let go. Yes, you were hurt. No, you didn't deserve it, but it wasn't your fault. And you can't allow it to dictate your future. Moving forward doesn't mean forgetting. It means letting go so you can go, so you can grow, and so you can glow. And then forgive me for anyone that I hurt, broke, treaded upon, or tore down because I didn't know how to process my feelings. Forgive me. Forgive me for projecting onto others what was projected onto me. Forgive me. You have to look yourself in the mirror and forgive yourself. Forgiveness is for you even if forgiveness is about you. You got to learn how to forgive. And then tell yourself, I choose peace. I choose tranquility. I choose positivity. And most importantly of all, baby, I choose me. 
free from the bondage of pain, insecurity, anger, fear, depression, anxiety, bitterness, the opinions of others. I choose to laugh. I choose tears of joy, not of pain. And then when you leave this den, leave the keys at the door and don't look back. Our problem is we spend too much time looking back and it's hard to move forward when you're looking back. Yes, it may be hard, but I promise you it'll be worth it. It's time to stop dodging what hurts you and face it. Face your Goliath, David, with your three stones, God, yourself, and your purpose. When you stop running from it and turn and face it, you'll realize how powerful you really are. And you'll realize the only thing you had to fear was fear itself. The only way the past can hurt you is if you stay trapped there. When you choose to live in the present and set goals that head you in the direction of your future, you'll realize just how bright your world can truly be when you step out of darkness into the marvelous light. And sometimes it's hard to see when you step into the light after you've been in the darkness for so long. But it's okay. Your vision will become clear. Feel the sun on your skin and let a new day begin. It's time for you to celebrate your Independence Day. Independence from fear, independence from darkness, independence from your past, independence from those who would try to hold you captive to your past. It's time to walk in the newness of you. But first, baby, you gotta take the escape plan. Take the route that's less walked, less traveled, because accountability isn't a road that's traveled by many. But the few who find it, find a level of greatness within themselves that they never thought was possible. And if you're ready to break free, you need to take your first step starting today. Thank you for joining us for another Wellness Waves Wednesday for the finale of Escaping the Heartbreak Hotel. I hope you learned something. I hope you've been blessed. And don't worry, these videos are going to remain here just in case you find your feet heading back. You know how to do an about face and head in the other direction. <laughs> like I said, on next week, we're going to be starting a new series. And that series is going to be called Managing Your Ship. So if you got a significant other, pull your significant other in. And let's learn how to protect those relationships so you don't end up in shipwreck. All right? If you enjoyed, consider hitting that like button for me. Consider joining the Champagne Gang and the Fizz Fam. Hit that subscribe button and the notification bell so you'll be notified when we jump into whichever sector we jump into for another show. Drop in the comments and let me know what you think. Let's talk about it. Confidence. Always remember, if it doesn't cause you to elevate, it's causing you to depreciate. Now raise those glasses, clink, and let's drink till we meet again. Ta-ta.